Welcome back everybody to a special reaction video. So, um, Kings and Generals, uh, at the time of recording this, have just released a new video on Ukraine. At the time this goes up, this will be about a week old, I think. Um, but this is how Ukraine liberated Kherson, um, which was alluded to in their last video, and I've kind of gotten into that on other videos too. Um, this is a 30-minute reaction, so we'll maybe split this into two parts, see how much I have to say about it. Um, I'm trying to kind of keep uh, reaction videos that I record now sort of between 20 minutes or so in length, discounting the intros and outros and stuff like that. Um, it might seem weird because a few videos that come out after this will be much longer than that, but that's because I actually recorded those before I'm recording this one, even though this one appears earlier in the schedule. Um, these ones I just crank out whenever Kings and Generals put them out, so... Um, Anyway, <laughs> all that by the by, um, just a few things as always before we start, please leave a like and some comments, um, make sure you're subscribed, there's reaction videos every Wednesday and Friday, specials on Mondays, not necessarily every Monday, but um, when there is something special I'll put it out on Monday, like original content, that kind of thing. Um, because this is a Ukraine video, there's also links in the description to donate to help out Ukraine in several different ways, so please go check those out as well. Um, but let's just go straight in. So this is Kings and Generals, How Ukraine Liberated Kherson. The most important event on the battlefield in Ukraine in the first half of November was the liberation of the city of Kherson after two and a half months of fighting since the start of the Ukrainian counter-offensive in late August. This remarkable victory of the Ukrainian army came after the annexation of Kherson Oblast by Putin and pledges from Russia never to leave this region. The Ukrainian command and HIMARS had a different idea, as Ukraine completed an important strategic and symbolic mission of liberating the sole regional center occupied by Russia since the start of the war in February 2022. Let's see how Hessen was liberated and what else happened in November's first half. Hey history fans, quick channel update. We like taking our time with our decisions and we want to create historical videos for you for decades to come, so some of our decisions happen slowly. Due to a request from our fans, we decided to cut ties with a certain sponsor. Unfortunately, this will impact our channel's finances negatively and will force us to release fewer videos in the upcoming months. On the one hand, it will happen because of the reduced funds available to be paid to our contributors, and on the other because of the current algorithm. As we've said previously, most of the money earned by this channel is being reinvested into more, better researched and better made videos, as well as our Wizards and Warriors and Cold War channels. Sponsorships and your continued support allow us to make up to 25 videos per month. Sponsorships allow us to cover our losses and release more videos, but cutting ties and losing those funds will make creating and releasing them unfeasible. We've got a great team and we want to be able to continue paying them living or competitive wages and not cut back on production. So please consider supporting our channel via Patreon, the link is in the description, and YouTube membership, the button under the video. For just $5 you can support our work, watch exclusive videos, there are 6 or 7 now and more are added every week, get early access to free videos, learn our schedule, get access to our private discord, watch our behind the scenes videos, and much more. Thank you for watching and for your kind support. We will Please do as well, because Kings and Generals are one of the best channels out there for history uh, content, so please do consider supporting them. I wonder who that's... Um that investor was though that um that was um, supporting them that they had to cut ties with and why i'm not I, this is the first time i've heard about this so i'm not sure but if anyone knows that'd be interesting we wouldn't be able to do what we love without you speculations related to the russian army's intentions continued in early november some of the elite forces of the russian army such as the 7th Guards Mountain Air Assault Division, were still operating on the right bank of the Dnipro. Newly mobilized troops were sent there, while Hessen occupation officials like Kirill Stremisov continued making statements about how the Russian forces would likely have to leave an occupied portion of the right bank of the Dnipro. The reported construction of defensive fortifications in the vicinity of Hessen was also inconsistent with the announcements of withdrawal as such fortifications usually indicate expected defensive battles. 
Reports of new trenches and bunkers followed this, and defensive positions were being built on the left bank of the Dnipro, even on the Black Sea coast. Bloggers informed us about three defensive lines beyond the Dnipro, which indicated preparation for a potential eventual Ukrainian attack in this area. On November 9th, the speculations were finally over. For two days, reports of heavy Ukrainian pressure on the critical and long-contested town of Snehirivka circled around, and the Russian units in the area finally had to withdraw before blowing a bridge in the area to delay the Ukrainian forward units. This was followed by information about the destruction of other bridges on the right bank of the Dnipro controlled by Russia, as the Russian army withdrew towards the Dnipro. This process culminated in the televised meeting of Sorovikin and Shoigu, in which the new commander of the Russian army in Ukraine told the defense minister that the most logical option of organizing defense would be along the river Dnipro. Shoigu responded, start withdrawal of troops beyond the river Dnipro. The pro-Ukrainian segment of social media rejoiced, while the Ukrainian officials called for calm, as they indicated that the words of Russian officials should not be trusted. The sentiments of the pro-Russian segment... Yeah, there was kind of um, a lot of speculation that it was potentially a trap because they were so, you know, publicly advertising this and broadcasting it. Um, because that's one of the things that's like a big no-no <laughs> in any which, which you'd think would be common sense which is to advertise your intentions um i can't remember what it was in relation to but i believe something similar happened in the falklands or i think it was the site of the british landings in the falklands they were published they, they were published published by the media the british media before the landings even happened and the Argentinians, from what I understand this, how the story goes, the Argentinians thought, no, that can't be true. You know, they, they can't be that stupid that they've just published their battle plans in the British media and that the, the British government have, like, not silenced this, that, you know, they've taken no steps to halt publication or anything. This must be a deception. So they tried, they kept their forces where they were, um, which was fortuitous because the British landed exactly where the media published and the landings were a success. Um, but at the time, uh, from what I remember, from what I remember reading about this, it was like a big scandal because, and the government were like up in arms about this because they were thinking, Jesus Christ, this is going to like scuttle our entire plan to retake the Falklands now that this is done. Um, but as it turned out, the Argentinians thought it was a deception, so they didn't do anything about it. And it turned out that it was the actual intent and it worked. Um, so the, there was similar kind of speculation here that it was a trap because they had so publicly um, advertised the fact. Um, there was still speculation that the dam around here, that they might blow the dam after retreating and flood, you know, pretty much this entire area, which would make life very difficult for Ukraine. Um, but as it turned out, as we'll see, that wasn't the case. ...were different. While a small group implied that this was just a tactic to lure the Ukrainian troops towards the Dnipro, where they would be destroyed, the vast majority of Russian posts on social media expressed anger, particularly against Putin. The latter was careful to leave the unpopular decision to be announced by his military commanders, but this did not save him from being blamed for this failure concerns of the Ukraine. Yeah, that's the thing with dictatorships as well, is that when you funnel all the responsibility to the top, um, in the case of someone like Putin, Hitler did the same thing as well, where he increasingly micromanaged affairs of his armed forces as the war went on, um, it becomes harder to escape that responsibility because in most circumstances, responsibility is often... Um, rightfully or wrongfully delegated downwards. Um, in most cases, I'd say it's wrongfully so, that some junior officer ends up taking the hit when, you know, it was someone else's plan, for example. Um, but it's it's just inescapable when you've, start, when you've started funneling all that responsibility towards yourself, um, people are going to blame you as well, even if, you know, you try and... Um, pin the blame on other people by having them announce it. People are just going to think, well, you're the one in charge. You're the one that's micromanaging this. So, and that's not something that's necessarily unique to dictatorships either. I mean, just look at 
you know, it's just it seems to be a natural facet of humanity that we look for the highest authority and then blame them for what's going on, even if they're not really within the power to do anything. Look at, you know, um, the blame that Biden got for increased gas prices in the US, even though that was something that was pretty much beyond his personal control. Um, he still gets the blame for it because he's in the highest reaches of power. So um, there's that kind of facet to it as well. Ukrainian command would not come to fruition, as for two days, the Ukrainian units were busy entering villages and towns abandoned by the Russian army. On November 11th, after more than eight months of occupation, the only regional capital of Ukraine occupied by Russia, Kherson, was liberated. Ukraine liberated some 4,800 square kilometers of Mykolaiv and Kherson oblasts in two days. Of course, this overshadowed another story, which took place on the announcement of the Russian withdrawal. On November 9th, the Russian-appointed official of the Kherson Oblast, Kirill Stremisov, died in a traffic accident in Henichesk. The timing of this accident is strange, as some Russian Telegram channel admins claimed that Stremisov was assassinated after being ruled redundant with the withdrawal from Kherson. Hmm. On the 15th, photos show... Wouldn't surprise me. There's been a fair few um, Russians in high places that seem to accidentally stumble out of a window, for example, um, throughout this war, so... ...his car ridden with bullets were released, making the accident hmm. less likely. Withdrawing Russian forces blew up the already heavily damaged Antonivsky Bridge on their way out. This withdrawal also reportedly forced the Russian command to relocate its bases, now in range of HIMARS, further away. For instance, it was claimed that the helicopter base in Chaplinka was relocated after the Russian withdrawal. On November 14th, Ukrainian President Zelensky visited Kherson and took part in the official ceremony dedicated to raising the Ukrainian flag in the city. The Battle of Kherson ended in yet another significant victory for the Ukrainian army. The counter-attack launched in this area in late August, after continuous HIMAR strikes on Russian supply lines on the right bank of the Dnipro and their military infrastructure in the area, resulted at first in territorial losses for the Russian army and then in complete withdrawal from this area due to inability to adequately supply its troops. The Russian army had a dilemma of standing their ground and fighting while running low on supplies and risking losing a considerable force of at least 20,000 men or saving this army and using the Dnipro as a natural barrier for their defense. Make no mistake, the Russian command chose the second option reluctantly, amidst intense pressure from the Ukrainian army. The Ukrainian military forced Putin to choose the lesser of two evils in this situation, which did not save him from an angry reaction at home. While the situation in Kherson had been getting increasingly complicated for Russia for months, the annexation of Kherson Oblast and pledges that Russia would always remain in Kherson gave hope to ordinary Russian citizens supporting the war that Russia would at least fight in Kherson. After all, Russia kept some of its elite units in Kherson, and despite all the difficulties they experienced, the Russian contingent was still formidable and combat ready. The True, but politically it looks very stupid because you've just declared that this is an annexed region and then, you know, barely in the blink of an eye later, you've lost the capital of that entire region. And your armies had to withdraw, which he said, relu you know, reluctantly withdraw, um, to establish a new defensive perimeter. So it just looks, and this is what I mean by, um, Russia just seems to not understand how to play the political battle very well. Um, because Kherson wasn't even, the, I'm talking about the, the whole region, the Oblast, the whole Kherson Oblast wasn't even secured when they announced its an annexation, which just seems, it's just insane, the, t the political timing of it, because for one thing, no one's going to buy that it's legitimate because you've got armies that are, you know, that are continuing to fight in this area. You know, if the Ukrainian front, front line was like up here or something like that, um, then it would look a bit more politically secure. But when you're announcing that you've annexed the region when you haven't even secured it yet, and then your army is forced into a humiliating retreat and then you lose the capital of the region, it just doesn't look very good. You know, it would be like in the American Civil War if um, if the Union had lost the Battle of Antietam 
and then had lost Washington, D.C. right after it, and then Lincoln announced the Emancipation Proclamation. You know, it would just be... The political timing of it would just be completely all wrong, so... Withdrawal is arguably one of the heaviest blows on Putin's legitimacy and popularity in Russia since the start of his reign. In an unexpected turn of events, one of the chief ideologues of Russia, one of the authors of the Russian world idea, which promotes the political and cultural unification of Russia, Ukraine and Belarus, Alexander Dugin, publicly criticized Putin. He wrote, Hassan is given away. Authorities, they are responsible for this. What is the point of absolutist rule which we have then? We give the ruler absolute power and he saves us all, the people, the state and citizens in critical moments. It is unpleasant if he surrounds himself with incompetent ministers and spits on social justice, but it is fine if he manages to save us. What if he does not? The absolutist rule also has a reverse side. Absolute power in success, but also absolute responsibility for failure. Remember the reign mm. kings. Yeah, which is kind of like what I got out earlier, which is that when you funnel all that responsibility to yourself, it becomes difficult to escape. Um, which is why, inevitably, autocratic regimes don't work. You know, they're just not particular. They don't produce successful states. I mean, you know, um, more often than not, they just end up collapsing and falling in on themselves. But those that don't look at North Korea, no one would describe North Korea as a successful state by any stretch of the imagination. So, you know, it just kind of goes back into that. So it seems that for a successful society, then um, a more democratic state is kind of a more natural ground state for something like that to work. Reign King is a reference to James Fraser's Golden Bough, monarchs chosen for a time of prosperity and killed in case they failed to invoke reign. This is about as scathing an attack as Putin ever received, particularly from his allies, and shows fractures in the Russian elite. To conclude the description of the situation on the Hezan front, I would also say as well that the fact that there are so many that seem to be perfectly comfortable with so openly criticizing him is probably more of a sign that Putin is perhaps more of a, you know, he's certainly, I don't want to say necessarily a puppet by any means of the Russian oligarchy because that would imply that he's not had any agency or say in these affairs, he absolutely has. Um, but it does seem that he's perhaps more, you know, the the first among equals kind of thing, kind of deal um, among the Russian oligarchy, rather than just a singular autocrat in his own right. That, you know, um, because in most other states, you know, these kind of fierce criticisms in most other autocracies, I mean, these kind of fierce criticisms would be met with immediate reproach. The fact that so many of them are not, you know, including people, you know, internal in Russia as well, like what we've just seen, or like the uh, leader of Chechnya and things like that, who have been pretty openly criticizing him um, from the start for the performance in this war. Um, it maybe shows that the regime is much more than Putin, because we've had like talk in the West, especially of like, oh, we just get rid of Putin and it'll all be fine, you know, and, it's, and I just think getting rid of Putin is just, it's rather like treating one symptom of a disease. You know, you've gotten rid of that symptom, but the disease is still there. So until that entire kind of cabal is just being extirpated from Russian political society, getting rid of Putin may not necessarily solve the problem that Russia has. Um, it will, he'll just be replaced by someone else from that clique, you know, that's more what I'm getting at. We should describe another interesting claim circulated on social media on November 13th and 14th. It has been claimed that Ukrainian special forces landed on Kinburn Spit on November 12th. Some have further stated that the unit was from the Ukrainian 73rd Marine Special Operations Center. The group reportedly traveled to Kinburn Spit on motorboats at night before landing near Pokrovska on November 12th and advancing all the way to Heroiske. Several pro-Russian bloggers confirmed that Ukraine had indeed tried to conduct an operation in this area, but were defeated by the Russian units. On November 14th, footage of Ukrainian special forces on motorboats going somewhere at night was shared. 
but they did not specify the destination of these motorboats. Although we do not think that it actually happened, it is worth monitoring if Ukraine indeed tries to reach the left bank of the Dnipro from Kinburn Spit. It is advantageous regarding the lack of Russian defensive fortifications and personnel in the area, but disadvantageous because it may cause problems with the sustainability of supplies. Kinburn Spit has marshland terrain, which is going to make forward movement difficult for either side, for the Russians to defeat the Ukrainian bridgehead if they have indeed established that, and for the Ukrainians to advance further. Furthermore, maybe useful as um, a diversion more than like the actual attempt for an assault. Um, but yeah, I can't see there being like a major amphibious landing there for that for those reasons. Rumors about the Ukrainian advance on Oleshki and battles in Holopristan circulated on November 14th and 15th. On November 15th, the Ukrainian command confirmed artillery strikes on enemy positions in this area but refuted any ground assault by the Ukrainian army. These artillery strikes may be a prelude for this ground assault, or could end up serving the purpose of fixing the Russian forces on the left bank of the Dnipro, which may prevent them from relocating elsewhere. Forcing the Dnipro and establishing a sustainable bridgehead on the left bank of the river will be difficult for the Ukrainian army. In any case, it does not look like the Ukrainian army intends to conduct an operational pause on this front and is looking to develop its success. We can safely speculate that at this point, the Ukrainian command is already looking for potential spots to create a bridgehead on the left bank of the Dnipro, as protecting the front of more than 200 kilometers is not going to be easy for Russia. But there is also information that Ukraine is already relocating some of its units that took part in the Battle of Kherson to Zaporizhia and North Luhansk, which may indicate that the Ukrainian command may want to avoid a costly advance to the left bank of the Dnipro and focus on other axes of potential attack instead. Yeah, which is something that um, I've alluded to in other videos as well, which and it makes sense because trying to cross a heavily defended river um, is going to be costly one way or the other. It's better to try and outflank the river or just completely cut them off. And I've said before, taking Melitopol um, and I've said before that the next counteroffensive we'll see will be probably Zaporizhia, because if they can um, break this sort of sector here and they can push down these roads to Melitopol, Melitopol contains the only functioning rail link between the Russian forces in Kherson and the main Russian supply um, sort of uh, axis around Donetsk in, in this area, which is where most of the fighting is taking place. Um, so if they take Melitopol, the Russian troops in Kherson have absolutely no way to be resupplied. Um, because the bridge, the Kirsch Bridge in Crimea is still heavily damaged. Um, and the fact that it was blown up once means that Ukraine can quite easily do it again if they want to. Um, which means that it's under threat. Um, so if, if the Ukrainians take Melitopol, the Russian troops in Kherson will be pretty isolated. Their only option will be to retreat to Crimea, or surrender essentially, because once they get to Crimea, there's pretty much no way out. You know, the troops could maybe get across the Kirsch Bridge, but they would have to leave behind most of their equipment, um, no doubt, um, in any event. So taking Melitopol will probably be the next big move, I would say. Um, and then you can get forces um, across the open land, sort of down here, um, towards the Russian forces along the Dnipro River, so you've got no need to cross the river. You can just keep the troops along the river just to pin them in place. So what happened on other fronts in this period? Heavy battles continued on the North Luhansk front, as the Ukrainian army attempted to take Svatova under control. They have been met with heavy resistance by the Russian army here. Russia has maintained the Troitska svatova kramina line on this front without losing considerable ground, despite the Ukrainian efforts near Svatova, Makivka, Kramina, and Kuzimivka. The Russian media reported the destruction of a battalion of Mobiks from Voronezh near Makivka. According to Verska, this battalion lost 529 men out of 570. Wow. So despite the relative stability of the front line, the battles have been extremely heavy. Russia has also attempted counter-offensives on this front, as they have reportedly recaptured a small amount of ground towards Novovodiana. Particularly fierce fighting also took place in the Kramina sector, 
where Russia has been trying to push the Ukrainian units away from the P-66 highway. But as of November 15th, the situation on the North Luhansk front remained largely unchanged. The overall stalemate on the Zaporizhian front continued too. More news on the deployment of additional units, particularly after the liberation of the right bank of the Dnipro from both sides to this front, was reported. For months it has been speculated that Ukraine is preparing for another counteroffensive, this time in Zaporizhia. For now, the stalemate continues, as the biggest news from the battlefield in this period was the capture of the southern part of Pavlivka by the Russian army. The pro-Russian sources started claiming this in late October, but it appears that after an initial setback, the 72nd Mechanized Brigade managed to negate the advance of the 155th Guards Naval Infantry Brigade and other elements of the Russian Marines. This frontal assault from the road, coming from Yehirivka, which is under Ukrainian fire control, has caused very significant losses on the Russian army. These losses were acknowledged by Russian military bloggers and later by the soldiers of the 155th Brigade, who sent a public letter to the governor of Primorsky Kray on November 6th. In this letter, they accused the Russian commander of the Eastern Military District, General Rustam Muradov, and his subordinate commanding officers of sending them to take Pavlivka even though the only road leading to it is under fire control of the Ukrainian defenders in Pavlivka and Vuladar, which has caused almost 300 men, KIA, WIA and MIA, destruction of 50% which is killed in, killed in action, missing in action, wounded in action of the military vehicles in four days. I think I got those the right way around in the order that he said. <laughs> but yeah, KIA killed in action, MIA missing in action, WIA wounded in action. This letter is more evidence that on the Donbass front, the Russian command continues sending its units on heavily damaging frontal assaults without much to show for it. The Russian MOD refuted this claim and stated that less than 1% of the brigade was killed and less than 7% was wounded due to battles in the past 10 days. Despite heavy losses, the Russian so. units in this sector managed to re-enter Pavlivka on November 7th, and by November 14th, the Russian MOD officially declared the capture of this village, although the footage on hand shows that they failed to advance past the center of this small settlement. The tactical purpose of this offensive is to reach Vuladar, as the Russians have unsuccessfully attempted to advance on it from Ikilska, but the strategic objective of this offensive is not yet clear. The fiercest battles continued to rage on the Donbass front, from Solodar in the north and Marienka in the south. Wagner mercenaries, DPR separatists, pro-Kadyrov Chechen battalions and regular Russian army units continued attacking Avdivka, Solodar, Bakhmut, Mayorsk, Vesela, Vodiana, Pervomyska, Novomikhailivka, Marienka, Andrivka, Klischivka, Zaitseva, Opitna and Ivanhrad. Two of the latter were already claimed to be under Russian control but battles in and around these towns raged in this period too. On November 2nd, the Russian and DPR units managed to gain a foothold in Marienka. On November 6th, Wagner entered the southern outskirts of Ivanhrad. On November 7th, Wagner and LPR units reportedly broke through Ukrainian defenses in Bilohorivka. On November 8th, the Russian media reported about mopping up operations in Bakhmutska. According to Russian telegram channels, by November 10th, Wagner units made advances in Bilohorivka, Andrivka, and Kleschivka. By November 14th, the Russian army and DPR militia reportedly captured Mayorsk, while Wagner made further advances inside Opitna. But these territorial gains continue to deplete the Russian manpower and military equipment reserves. The current yeah, which is kind of like what I've gotten at before, which is that they they make these advances, but they're just sapping. You know, they're they're making these advances, gaining very little for them, um, and they're they're expending a great amount of resources and manpower to do so. So they're just grinding themselves into the dirt, essentially. Um, Bakhmut, is, um, especially, has been in a lot of focus lately for a lot of heavy fighting around that area, um, but it's likely that we're going to see more of a stalemate across the next couple of months just purely because it's winter. Um, winter makes advances very difficult for both sides, so um, it's possible that there won't be much fighting, if any, but um, I think the Ukrainian side is perhaps more equipped to deal with that winter than the Russian side is, 
purely because the Ukrainian side has just had so much um, in the way of a sustainable and very reliable and also very advanced supply line from NATO and other countries, um, particularly in supplying cold weather gear and that kind of thing. Whereas if Russia is starting to rely increasingly on what are essentially conscripts, these troops aren't going to be particularly well equipped to deal with cold weather. So it's going to be kind of ironic if the Russian army is the one that gets ground, uh, ground down in the winter front line has been heavily fortified since the war in Donbass broke out in 2014, and it is extremely difficult to advance there. The strategic purpose of advancing on this front, while losing on the Kherson and North Luhansk fronts, is still unclear. The most plausible explanation is Putin's wish to take the whole area of Donetsk Oblast under Russian control, in order to be able to proclaim some sort of victory but the current pace of Russian advance is inadequate compared to the extremely heavy losses they have been taking on this front. Russia... Yeah, and also it's going to do no good to win Donetsk if you've lost both the flanks around it, because then Donetsk is essentially just going to be sandwiched from three sides. So, because it can be attacked from... Say if Russia did advance all the way out to the edge of the Donetsk blast, they're going to be attacked from uh, this direction, sort of using... Dnipro is perhaps the main supply route, and um, so they're going to be attacked from here, they're going to be attacked from into Luhansk, and they're going to be attacked from up from Kherson as well. So what good is it going to do them in the end? It continues to implement measures to restore the losses of its manpower and military equipment. Russian people are still receiving mobilization summons as of early November. Moreover, Ukrainian authorities of Melitopol and Mariupol stated that Russia has been coercing locals into Russian-organized territorial defense units. On November... Okay, um, we've cut to a different sector there, so we're about ha just over halfway in, so I think we'll call it a day there. Um, but part two will come tomorrow, um, so there won't be much of a wait between the two parts, so you'll get some extra content this week. Um, but let me know what you think in the comments, and thank you all so much for watching, and I shall see you all on the next one.